Welcome everyone. Thank you very much for joining us at the uh, NAMA's How to Start and Grow a Mushroom Club. So we have some great people that joined us tonight. I'm very grateful for all of our panelists. We have five panelists tonight, which I'm gonna introduce here. Um, from the Blue Ridge Mycological Society, we have John Dent and Pat Mitchell. From the Philadelphia Mycology Club, we have Samantha Bucciarelli. From the Rhode Island Mycological Society, Dina Tempest Thomas. And from the West Colorado Mycological Association, Hamilton Pevitt. So all of, all of these panelists, they're from mushroom clubs that are somewhere between one and five years old. I think I got that right. Um, so they're all relatively new mushroom clubs that have been pretty successful. A couple of them have just joined NAMA just recently in the past month or two. Very awesome. <laughs> Big congrats to those clubs. Um, it's really cool. Uh, what we've done tonight is the Club Relations Committee, we put together this agenda for the evening where we came up with a number of different topics that we thought would be of interest to people who are interested in starting a mushroom club and also interested in expanding and growing their own mushroom, the clubs that they may be in. Um, we got a number of different clubs involved here because we realize that every club is different and every state or province is different as well. So what's what applies here in one particular region of the country may be a little bit different in a different region. And uh, we very much in NAMA like the idea that every club is different and every club has its own flavor. Um, what one club does one way is may not exactly be the best fit for another club. So hopefully we're gonna get a number of different viewpoints here tonight. Um, and we can really just jump right into this. So with that being said, the way that um, agenda goes tonight is we're gonna spend an hour on these questions and topics. And at the end of the hour, uh, we can take questions. So if people have questions, we can put them right into the chat and I will try to read through them as they come in. So let's start out with our beginning topic. How did your club start? Um, anybody wanna jump right in there on that one? I'll start with that. Great. Um, there was a, there was, I I uh, was a member, I still am a member of the Colorado Mycological Society, which is based out of the Denver, Denver Botanical Gardens. And um, Greg Sanchez and John Summers are the sort of on again, off again presidents of that club. And I started reaching out to them three or four years ago to create a chapter of CMS in Western Colorado. And after uh, harassing them for many years, they basically just said, you know what, like, we don't want to deal with the logistics and the sort of administrative task of doing that. So just start your own club. And, um, and so that's what I did. And uh, I had the benefit of, you know, accessing mentors like John Summers, um, who had been president for a long time of a mushroom club and Trent and Brooke from NAMA. And so I got to pick their brains about sort of that initial startup process. But ultimately, uh, I've, I wanted to start this club because I knew there was a demand for it and it didn't exist in my area. Like I knew there would be tons of people interested and there was no uh, outlet for us to gather in a formal way. And, um, and so meeting that need was really the primary motivation. Were there, and, were there roadblocks that really surprised you? No, actually I was well prepared. Um, I, I formed my board of directors first and then we built out our bylaws together through the course of like three or four very long discussions. <laughs> <laughs> about you know who who we wanted to be and how we wanted to operate and and game out you know eventualities and and sort of try and anticipate um what would happen if we grew to be a massive club um and and prepare prepare for that you know in the beginning it's pretty easy to manage because you know the budget is basically our operating cost 
And, um, and I think it only really gets complicated for boards to operate um, smoothly once there's a lot of money to spend. Okay, um, but, you know, in this case, it was like, you know, we, we started in, in the late March of last year and immediately got a bunch of members right off the bat. And then it's been steadily growing all year up to a hundred members now. All right. Thanks, Hamilton. Yeah. How about Dina? How about Rhode Island? Um, so I did things sort of backwards. Um, I fell in love with mushrooms and mycology, but there wasn't a club near me. So I was driving like two and a half, three hours up um, to the Boston area to go on walks with them. And I just loved it so much. And um, with basically no experience, I um, reached out to another local mushroomer here and was like, hey, can you lead a walk for me? And so he did. And it just slowly um, went from there, you know, just maybe five people walking in the woods together and um, made a website, made Facebook, and slowly just sort of um, figured it out as I went along. Um, Great. And you've been trucking right along. Huh? Yeah, it's it's been a lot of fun. And I've met so many amazing, enthusiastic people. So it's it's been one of my favorite things ever. Have have you found many roadblocks? Um, I think one of the things that um was a challenge was finding an a space to use, especially if you want to have an indoor um, meeting with like a PowerPoint. Um, I didn't realize that for nonprofits, you could use a library for free. So that was really helpful um, once I learned that because most of the venues, you know, they they charge money for to hold events and um, sort of navigating where, um, where can you go to a park or um, different places have different rules about how many people can be there, um, things like that. So in the beginning, it was sort of, um, you know, a, a little bit more work figuring out which places worked for what we were trying to do. Great. How about the uh, Blue Ridge Mycological? So um, I we kind of did things backwards as well. Um, I had been really in love with fungi for a few years and and actually going to the event at, um, at Telluride Mushroom Festival had met a lot of people who were involved with the Mycoflor project in, in particular, which is now Fundus. Um, seeing what they were doing, it made me realize like, okay, I, I kind of need a group to go into the woods with. Like I can't just be going in by myself or with a couple friends, like, you know, there's a lot of things that we can do with the group that we can't, you know, so I came back to Virginia and reached out to a couple people in the area who were kind of talking about meeting and it just, I would have had to drive, you know, two and a half, three hours north or two and a half hours south, kind of like Dina. And so it was, it was just a decision to sort of, yeah, maybe, Maybe we should make one ourselves. And, and um, a guy on Facebook, Mike McMahon, saw me poking around and asking the questions. And he's like, dude, let's just do it. And so we just did it. And um, yeah, it's it's kind of been a wild, wild ride. We've only just recently started becoming more organized and, you know, getting all of our ducks in a row. That's, that's generally how we started, where it all came from. Awesome. Thanks, Pat. Sam, yeah. how about Philadelphia? You want to tell us about how Philadelphia started? Yeah, so um, my colleague Bethany Tigan started um, noticing mushrooms in the wild in uh, summer of 2018, which anyone on the East Coast would remember was an amazing mushroom year. Um, and she was trying to learn more about mushrooms, realized that there was not already a club in Philadelphia, and started a Facebook group with the idea that if you build it, they will come. And then they came. And we ended up with a few um, pretty knowledgeable club members early on. Um, this is, of course, back in 2018. And um, we got a few people who had a lot of foraging experience. Um, 
we had the honor of Luke Smithson, our host tonight, being nearby. So he began showing up to a few things. Um, and we are fairly close to New Jersey. So we were able to attend some of the uh, New Jersey Mycological Association events um, to learn a little bit more. And um, very rapidly, our Facebook group grew to a thousand members, uh, two thousand members, and now our Facebook group has five thousand members in it, um, which is so crazy and exciting. Um, so it did start out as a Facebook group, and then um, within the last year, became we filed the five hundred one c three paperwork, um, and now we are an official organization, which is really cool. All right, thanks, Sam. I so, do have some roadblocks that we faced along the way. Oh, please. One, oh. I think one of the biggest roadblocks was that um, in 2020, during the pandemic, um, we had large groups of people joining us on the trails, which was awesome because so many people were really interested in mushrooms and really interested in getting into nature at that time. But the Philadelphia parks were overloaded with people during the pandemic. And we started to get some backlash from the parks staff um, about leading groups in the parks, specifically because collecting is not permitted within the city of Philadelphia. Um, and we still have not figured out how to get around that. So we moved many of our events out into the local state parks. And maybe we'll circle back to that when we get down to permitting. Mm -hmm. How about a mission? Have you developed a mission in Philadelphia? Yeah. Um, on the night of our first official board meeting, we had um, people in our community that we intended to vote in as board members that evening and other members of our community and volunteers that were pretty involved in the club at that time and still are. Um, and we got a chalkboard and i wrote um i wrote on the board um what are some words that you would like to have incorporated into our mission statement and on the board we ended up with the words education community stewardship um and diversity so those were four things that made it into our mission statement um that really drive our club our club is really heavily community based. And um, so it was really important for that to be in there. But we also do a lot of stewardship in the parks department and, um, of course, education. And then when it came to diversity, we were looking to include that not just as preservation of fungal diversity in our area, but also incorporating um, people who were often considered to be um, on the fringes of society, marginalized communities, um, and people of diverse backgrounds of all kinds. We wanted to make sure that they could feel welcome. Initially, the very first thing you read in the mission statement. Great. Thanks, Sam. How about the other clubs here? Um, do any of the other clubs have mission statements? Oh, yeah, we, we have a mission statement. Um... I don't know it by heart, <laughs> uh, but it focuses on fostering community education and um, and stewardship as well. Uh, I it, it, w the way we came up with our mission statement was just looking at how we wanted to be as a club uh, in the board of directors, uh, mm -hmm. and. You know, we went through many iterations before we landed on the the one that actually made it into our bylaws. And, you know, I want to come back to this question about roadblocks, all the roadblocks that came up for the club and organizing and starting the club was really once we got going. It wasn't about getting it started. It was about how to keep it operating. Yeah. Well, I, I ask about... um the mission statement and wondering have you used your mission statement to help get around roadblocks or make decisions as a club 
leader? Personally, no. All of our roadblocks are technical. Okay, technical. <laughs> about, about, about Blue Ridge, do you have a mission statement and how do you use the mission statement to guide you? Um, our mission statement is pretty simple. Um, we strive to promote networking, learning, and mycology related discussions. We, you know, that that's a piece of it, you know, that one of the parts that we added to our bylaws. John, you can correct me if I'm wrong on this. Um, but yeah, we, we really aim to have a space that is safe and comfortable for people to kind of come together with their mycology obsessions or love. And, um, and it's, it's all about the people, you know, for, for me, all the events that I've gone on, I was stoked on my way to get there to find the mushrooms. And I ended up leaving with all these lifelong relationships of people that are into the same thing and, you know, doing really interesting research. And so that's kind of been my mission with how I started this from the beginning. And it's kind of represented in our current mission statement is to just be a hub where people can come together and network with each other. Um, did you have anything else to say on that though, John? Well, you know, we emphasize keeping the fun and fungi. If you keep things light and enjoyable while you're doing all the stuff with the board and all the bylaws and everything, you don't want to put that burden on your members unless there's some that want to kind of join you. So we kind of keep that. They're off, you know, they're welcome to sort of contribute, but we try to keep a lot of that away from them. And then we try to keep an eye out for anybody in our club who might be a little bit on the edge of the club for various reasons and make sure that they're really welcomed. And Pat's really good at this. And um, we have a for, we did begin dues this year, but we have a president's exception, which he can apply to anybody who thinks where the dues would be too much of a burden to keep them from participating. And so we look out for people. And if we think there's somebody who wants to join us and some reason is missing out for some reason, we try to help them do that, no matter what, you know who they are, where they come from. Great. Thanks, John. Dina, do you have anything you'd like to add to that? Have, has Rhode Island developed a mission statement? Yes, we we do have a mission statement. Um, I don't remember off the top of my head exactly what the wording is. Um, but um, when things first started for me, I was just amazed that I went through my life without knowing about the, these organisms, about fungi. You know, I spent a lot of time in the woods. And um, like Pat, I um, found out about the fungal diversity survey and that fungi have no protections in place. And so that was something that was really important. And um, a big motivator for even starting the club was like, everybody should know about how cool these organisms are. And um, conservation of fungi and um, stewardship um, was was one of the really important um, part of the mission for me. Cool, thank you. So next question. Where do, you, where do you find your members at? Dina, do you want to start that? Um, I, I find a lot of members through um, networking with people that are involved with conservation work already. Um, the land trusts, um, reaching out to them and just offering, hey, I could lead a mushroom walk for you. And um, connecting with those folks. Um, here in Rhode Island, there's a yearly bio blitz. And I think that's something that happens in a lot of other parts of the country. Um, if you've never been to a bio blitz, I highly recommend it. Um, and I've, I've met some great people um, there and um, through libraries has been another um, really important uh, relationship. Um, we do uh, events in the city. Um, um yeah i don't know, I don't know. what else great thank you say. yeah <laughs> yeah um how about the other clubs where are we finding members at social media communications and mailing lists partnerships like where do you find them at I would love um, to in. oh yeah go ahead thank you um so i did mention that our club started as a facebook group so we still have a really big presence on Facebook. Um, our Facebook community group sees um, dozens of posts per day during the um, like mushroom growing season, which is probably like now through December in Philadelphia. And um, 
we also have an active mailing list. So around 2020, we started to get a lot of people who were either moving off of social media or had found us, you know, somehow like through the grapevine um, and asked us to create a mailing list. So we send all of our events out by email. And uh, last year we got a wonderful volunteer who is a communications professional and she started up a newsletter as well, which is really cool. And she puts lots of really good stuff in there, jokes, poems, um, and fun little graphics. So it's really nice to engage people in our mailing list that way as well. I will also say we have these absolutely adorable, oh, can you see them? Business cards, we just got new ones. I put a QR code on the back to join our iNaturalist project. Um, and we hand these cards out at um, the farmer's market where we sell our merch. I will also say we have some pretty see, uh, sick merch that we sell at local farmer's markets and um, at some of our events. Um, and then we, of course, also partner with a lot of other organizations. So um, we partner with environmental centers, um, libraries, colleges, uh, local craft clubs, mm -hmm. uh, the botanical club, the ornithological club, um, and a lot of other organizations around the city. And so through our network of partners, we also get a lot of members that way. Um, so if, say, I'm doing a speaking engagement for the Mütter Museum, um, a lot of people who heard about that are fans of the museum. And then um, we'll then hear about us through their network. So um, that has been a really awesome way to gain people for our club as well. Can the you, business um, cards really help. <laughs> great. Can you tell us what a bioblitz is? Somebody asked that. Oh, I would love to. Um, so a bioblitz is a really fun event in which um, a bunch of people gather or don't gather but um, use the same time frame to go out and record biodiversity, usually of all kinds. So that usually includes obviously plants, fungi, animals, um, bacterium, protists, uh, whatever is out there, um, usually using something like iNaturalist. There is a global bio blitz that happens every year on iNaturalist that is coming up. April 26th through the 29th, it's called the City Nature Challenge. Um, I bet if you're near a major city, it's happening probably near you because 500 cities compete and collaborate across the globe every year. So please join the City Nature Challenge if you're nearby. <laughs> so if you're in one of these bio blitzes, you're handing out those business cards? Absolutely, I am. I will be giving one of these to every one of the Drexel students I'm meeting with on Friday the 26th. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. How about the, uh, the Blue Ridge? How are you guys finding members? Um, in in the beginning, we were a Facebook group. And so, you know, kind of same thing. A bunch of people that were on other mushroom groups found us. Um, I think one of the quickest ways that we got members was simply having a meeting during Morel season. Um, like our meetings would be like, 10 or 15 people, maybe five people or even two for a long time. And then Morel season would come around and there'd be like 60 people. Um, we do kind of laugh because it's like, you know, the mushroom pubs version of like an Easter service where like people who don't go to church all of a sudden once a year go to church, mm -hmm. but we've like retained a lot of people. Like they catch the hype and they come, come into it thinking they're going to just find more L's. And then they're like, Whoa, there's more to this. Like, these people are nerds. Um, and then like, uh, I don't remember who, if it was uh, Dina or Sam, but you know, I've also gotten myself into my local parks and rec teaching mushroom little presentations, going on walks, UV night walks, every single event I go to, people want to know, like, tell me about the club, tell me about the club. Um, but yeah, John, where else do we get members right now? But you're the membership guy. You know, um, well, giving talks at like-minded institutions. So we uh, we were pretty rurally oriented, and we're spread out pretty far. So, but Charlottesville is somewhat a center as Lynchburg is, and we have a really great nature center that many of us are 
participants in. And so you look out, if people are interested in nature, they're potentially interested in mushrooms. And so if you have a speaker come in, it's a great way to bring in people who aren't in your organization already, who might be future partners for you. And so we're trying to do a lot more of that and it's worked very well for us back this year, particularly. Great. How about uh, Western Colorado? Any tips on picking up members? Uh, I didn't know we were allowed to go look for them. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, we, we, we get a surge in membership around 4A season in Colorado. We have a very short mushroom season, you know, it's the month of August. It's, you know, it bleeds into September and early July, a little bit. Like if we're lucky, we get like six weeks of primetime mushroom season. Um, and so we, we see a surge there just through our expert guided forays. People just want to go and learn. And then there's often, basically we poster, like we locally market, um, our monthly members meetings to be open to everybody. They're free. They're open to everybody. And then, you know, the, the subject matter is really diverse. So, you know, we 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 often retain people who just come to one meeting and then of course uh we partner with other clubs so i'll go and give a talk to the local garden club or whatever and a bunch of those people will join our club and and some of our club will join their club and it's this kind of back and forth that way um and then generally like i'll have a sign up sheet uh, every like live event that I do, I say, if you're interested in the club, like first join our email list and then come to a meeting. Um, but we don't really actively like go out of our way to go and look for members. We started a Facebook group. It very quickly went up to about a thousand people and then like plateaued. And, you know, it's a private group, so it's we try and keep it pretty tight inside the Facebook group so we minimize in terms of admin work. Um, but, you know, I think, I think that you can draw a straight line from the amount of proselytizing you do to the growth of your club. You know, it's basically marketing. It's, it's the bottom line. And we just don't put that much effort into it except to try and make people know like what we're actually doing every month. Okay, great. So it sounds like Facebook's really popular amongst the clubs for communication and that sort of thing. How about other communication platforms? Is anybody using anything else like Meetup or Google Groups? We use Instagram and Facebook. Okay. And it's like, it just seemed like a logical extension of the club. Mm -hmm. How about any of the other clubs or anybody using anything we, besides those two? We we started um, to try and use Discord. Um, it's not really caught on with the members yet, but I've used it extensively, you know, in other in other contexts. And um, and so when we started it, we kind of ran like a practice round of like you know the board member discussion. And as you know, Discord is kind of like Slack where you can like create all these different subcategories and categories and um, it really organizes conversation and flow. And, and so it, it's been working pretty well actually with our board, you know, like if you can keep the conversations in their appropriate subject, um, it helps with events, event coordination and sharing of documents and timelines and, you know, that kind of stuff. I, I feel like it probably will pick up because there are a lot of people who don't want to use Facebook anymore. And it was sort of our attempt to give them some space to enter into the discussion and community. Um, but yeah, it's pretty, as far as the members go, it's pretty uh, quiet right now, but, but yeah, discord has been great. It's free. Great. Well, also we, we created a website this year, um, which actually oh, had yeah. a huge amount of work with and It's kind of nice to have a home. I don't think we would say that it's been a breakthrough for communicating with people, but we put all of our events there um, and then past events. And so you can, you feel like there's a home for your club. It was a fair amount of work and uh, I think worthwhile. And it is linked to both Facebook and discord. So we're trying to create a network. I will say one tool we haven't completely um, mastered is sign up sheets and things like that for events, because you don't want too many people coming. 
You want to know who's coming and to manage it somewhat. And we've looked at a lot of tools. The free ones all have some issues. Our budget didn't really include, you know, wanting to spend a whole lot of money on some of the bigger ones that a lot of the larger organizations use. And so we're using still free ones, which have problems, you know, with ads and not the functionality you want. We'd like to eventually have a database so we can manage our membership better. And that's probably what we're going to work on in the next year or two. Okay. Sam, how is the Philadelphia Club, how are they communicating with their members? You'd mentioned a, uh, a mailing that goes out. Yeah, so every time we create an event, um, that gets sent out as an evite to people on our mailing list. And then um, every other month, we send out a newsletter that has some recurring sections in it. Um, we have an event section that gives um, like an overview of the events happening in the coming month. And we have a what's fruiting section that includes the top 20 species found in the Philadelphia area for the upcoming month. And we also have a species highlight that um, we aim to put in as um, a species that is common but under observed on iNaturalist. So for example, um, the one in the last newsletter was Spring Beauty Rust. I think the one before that was Trimedes cinnabarina. Um, just things that are like pretty common, easy, anybody could find them in our area. Um, but things that don't have a lot of observations on iNaturalist. And then aside from that, we have some occasional um, columns from different volunteers around our club or knowledgeable people in the area. and. Um, we're hoping to bring in a history section as well. So um what, what platform are you using for the mailings? Oh yeah, great question. We use MailChimp for our newsletter. MailChimp was free until we got a certain number of subscribers. And now we pay a very hefty price of $28 a month um for MailChimp. But it's in my opinion, it's worth it because it does allow us to communicate um, effectively with our community and um, it gives people a way to sign up for a thing because our club does not charge any dues. So this is like signing up for our mailing list is essentially how you join our club. Okay, great. Dina, does Rhode Island have any specific uh, platforms that they prefer to use for communicating? Um. Well, we use Squarespace for our emails. Um, I think uh, iNaturalist has been a great connector. Um, you know, people people uh, will communicate a, a lot on there, which has been helpful. Because um, I forget who mentioned, but a lot of people have left Facebook in recent recent times. So, mm -hmm. iNaturalist has been um, really sort of. Uh, a great way to, to learn and um, help each other out. Okay, great. So yeah, a lot of good platforms out there these days. So John, I wanted to start this section asking you, at what point did your club decide to further the organization of your club? So, so you, yeah. Go ahead. So I joined a couple of years ago um, and um, then Pat and I attended a really great course down in the Highlands in North Carolina where we were there for about five days with the Bassettes run, actually. And so we just started talking about the club and Pat started mentioning things that he, where he wanted to take it. And I've done a lot of organizing and paperwork in my career. And so I said, well, this, you know, isn't that big of a problem to create a board. You know, he had a board, but to formalize the board to, and then spend a fair amount of time deciding if we wanted to do the 501c3 transition or not. It's not a slam dunk for every club. There are benefits to it. And then there's a fair amount of hassle. Um, I have a huge amount of experience with paperwork applications and credentialing. So it was really easy. So I just offered to do that. If you want to do that, you want at least one member who's pretty committed to do it because there's a lot of paperwork you have to do. But there's a myth that it's really expensive. It isn't very expensive. It's mainly just attention to detail. And so we talked about it and we weren't really sure whether we wanted to do it. But for the possibility of getting donations in the future, we thought that was one great thing. And also it, it was a great focal point for us to 
reorganize the board, do a formal set of bylaws, articles of incorporation, look at other clubs and do comparisons. And so it kind of got us into all the things we probably should have done a couple of years ago. Um, and then we went through the transition this year and became a 501c3 through the IRS, state of Virginia. We're now, it turns out there's always a little something extra. In Virginia, you have to file something to the Department of Agriculture if you want to solicit donations because they're wary of people coming in and stealing from people. And that's our last thing we have to do. We've gotten a bunch of donations, but we haven't asked at this point. So we can't put a donate button on our website until we do this one bit of paperwork. We felt though by going through all of this, it made us a much better organization because it is in order to satisfy all those regulations, you do have to do the things we probably should have done a couple of years ago. Um, and it's also probably, and we'll talk a little bit about risk management later in the talk. It makes you a little bit more conscious about your risk profile which is easy to overlook in the first couple of years of a club. You don't think about it, but there are a fair amount of risks associated with clubs and not just going to happen to you, but you want to think about it and have some plans for that. We talked, for example, about identifying uh, mushrooms um, on Facebook. Um, you know, if you go out the way we all, of course, like to do it is go out in the woods, see the habitat, take the big picture, take the small picture, take multiple pictures, cut the thing up, you know, check it for bruising or whatever, discoloration. And then when you make the call there, it's one thing, when you do it on social media, you and particularly because a lot of people like on Facebook say, I just found this, can I eat it? You know? <laughs> and uh, so, you know, I, I know you see, you see you all smiling. It's not something we want to really do. Uh, we want to be helpful, but you are putting yourself a little bit out there unless you're really careful about it. And I know, for example, that NAMA doesn't do identification of fungi on, on, uh, on, on the web. So it got us through all of those different discussions to do it. And overall, it was really worth it. But I would not say that every club automatically needs to do the 501c3 transition. You, there are other ways you can do it. Mm -hmm. What what do you feel like is the biggest benefit of having that designation? Uh, getting, uh, actually getting donations potentially. Um, it, it also, so the donation thing is a little complex because the tax laws changed a few years ago and less people are now itemizing. Um, but it turns out that people in their 60s and 70s, if you happen to have members in that group, are actually fairly likely to want to give away money. Um, for example, when they, get into their upper 60s and 70s, their tax reasons. And so if you're a 501c3, you can accept those donations easily. Some of them have donor funds and they can only give to a 501c3. Um, but it may be that you don't want to attract a whole lot of donations, but that is probably the best thing. It also does change your status a little bit when you interact with other organizations, when you tell them you're a 501c3. They know you spent the time and you're serious about it. And that's a hard thing to quantify. Um, and then, as I mentioned, it does show that you've gone through, done all the paperwork. We The best thing we probably did was we have a lot of clubs in the area in different parts of Virginia, and, and we looked at a lot of their bylaws and articles of incorporation, and we compared and contrasted where we wanted to be. And so it brought us up to a higher level just going through that and just being forced to sit down and do it, basically. And so I think our club is on much better footing. Whether our members have any idea about that, I think the main thing they saw is we decided we were going to really communicate better, and we've done a much better job of that as a result of this. Okay. Sam, I know the Philadelphia Club has recently gone through the uh, whole change of becoming a non its nonprofit status. Do you have any comments on that? Um, have, do you really feel like it's uh, helped Philadelphia? Yes, I do definitely feel like it has helped us and that it was the right choice for our organization. At the time that we filed, which was about a year ago, um, we had been accepting donations and had acquired a couple thousand dollars in donations that we mostly, I mean, were pouring back into the club anyway, buying things like books and t-shirts and um, other useful materials, business cards. Um, but we wanted to make sure that we were being transparent with people about that. Um, and we figured that it would be the right and natural next step for us to file the, that paperwork. I will say that to this day, filling out form 1023 was, is my biggest achievement um, because it was myself that filled the paperwork out and it was very challenging, but um, also very rewarding. And um, I will never forget the feeling that I had when we got the approval paperwork back in December. So right. um, yeah, it was the natural next step for us. As far as um, some of these other things go, in our bylaws, um, it was really important to us, specifically myself and Beth, um, to 
include in our bylaws that we would have no paid membership um, and no dues associated with that. And the reason why we chose that is because we live in a big city. Our area covers a city um, with an in incredible amount of wealth disparity. And so when I started organizing for the, um, the Philadelphia Mycology Club, any amount of membership dues would have been prohibitive for me. And I don't ever want anyone to feel like they can't show up to a thing and can't be a member of a community because they don't have $10 for the year, which it's it, looking back on that. It's crazy to think I didn't have that at the time, but I didn't. And um, so that was really important to us. And we wrote it into our bylaws that that would be true. Okay. And it has been working out fine for us since then. All right. Thanks, Sam. Dina, I'm curious about Rhode Island and their leadership, your leadership and your oversight team. Can you tell us just a little bit about like how many people are involved in that and how you came up with that? Um, so we call it the Mushroom Council and we have um, six members and we, ha we have uh, a good amount of other people that are sort of advisors, um, but the, the council, um, you know, consists of people with different skills. Um, most of you probably know Spike. He is he's on the council and um, another gentleman named Patrick who's extremely knowledgeable. So um, everybody has their little piece that they bring to the table and, and contribute. Um. Great, thank you. How about Hamilton? How about the Western Colorado's uh, leadership structure? Well, we formed a board with five members with a quorum of three people. And there was someone asking about how, how you choose these people. Mm -hmm. And I just reached out to my friends that I knew were mushroom geeks and that would be willing to at least consider taking the journey, you know, and, and, and being part of something and basically working for free. You know, we are a hundred percent volunteer organization and that matters. It, it matters to be a 501 C three because it lends uh, an air of legitimacy to our volunteer-based organization. I mean, donations obviously are wonderful, but it also makes us official in a way. Uh, and, um, you know, it, it requires a, a certain amount of commitment in order to make things happen. You know, like uh, actually working, uh, it just it just occurred to me um, in the last couple of months that like I had to admit to myself that I think I'm a high functioning individual and that not everybody um, functions the way that I do. <laughs> and like acknowledging that, you know, it might take time for other people to do things where I see like it's, oh, this is only going to take 15 minutes. Like, let's do it. Why wait around? Why delay? And I think, you know, choosing people that actually want to be proactive on a board is super critical. Um, if you get people that are just interested in mushrooms that aren't willing to actually do the legwork, then you're going to have problems. All right. All right, thank you. So let's move on to planning um, meetings, walks, and forays. Um, are your, Hamilton, are your forays open to members only or the general public? We are members only expert guided forays. This is basically the only perk that we offer. Plus you get to buy the shirt. <laughs> <laughs> we don't, it's our only incentive really uh, for our members right now. Um, and we fill up our forays. We only can do three or four a year. Uh, I'd love to do more, but it's really difficult. Um, I mean, I don't have time to lead more than one or two myself. And then, um, you know, we have very small groups to, to, um, basically meet the rules of the national forest. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then it basically, we use Google forms to sign up 
people and on a first come first serve basis. And, um, and then that form contains a liability waiver. Okay. Do you have meetings that are outside of the four A's? Yeah, we have monthly meetings um, that are free and open to anybody who wants to come. Okay, there you go. So Dina, I thought that was interesting that you said that um, you found public libraries to be a great space for meetings. So your club is having regular meetings? Um, we have a variety of events. Um, at the libraries, we'll often do art events. Um, mm -hmm. And we have walks. We have even walked in the winter. I think it's always mushroom season. It's just a different mushroom that is in season. Um, and uh, we did a growing workshop that uh, we had translators for. That was really exciting for me um, to just bring mushrooms to diverse audiences and, and not just out in the rural um, area here in Rhode Island. Um, and our one of our big events that we do is a mushroom mingle. And um, a lot of our events are open to the public, but we also have things that are, that are just for members only. So our mushroom mingle is really, um, we do that in the beginning um, of spring and it's for members and non-members and everybody just kind of gets together and, and talks. And that has been really a, a fun thing for us. Awesome. Thank you. Sam, about Philadelphia. I know you said that Philadelphia has struggled with overcapacity on the walks. Um, do you want to talk about that and how taking RSVPs and capacity limits has limited yeah, um, so last year we had, I'm, I'm sorry, let's go back. Um, after we moved our events out of the city of Philadelphia and into the local state parks, um, we opened up these events to specifically our forays um, to be open to anyone and we did not have a cap on registration. Um, thinking that there would be no way that we would get more than 100 people who showed up to this event. But we were wrong. <laughs> and last year we had one foray in which we had um, probably close to about 120 people at the foray. Um, and so that was really exciting, also very challenging. Um, and it did lead for um, lead us to apply for permits for the upcoming foray season and begin putting um, caps on even our larger events. Um, with that, that has brought the challenge of having to respond to emails of people canceling their tickets last minute. Um, and then because all of our events are free and open to the public, um, navigating the space of free events being less of a commitment for a lot of people. And um, that has also been very challenging. I will say, however, a lot of our non-foray and non-guided walk events, like our lectures, our craft events, uh, socials, potlucks, um, jerky contests, um, those events um, typically will fill up in capacity on our event platform. We use something called Humanitix, but we're thinking about switching over to a site called Give Butter. Um, which is exclusively for nonprofits. But anyway, um, those events will typically fill up and then um, we have a waiting list. So usually we can get people on the waiting list in to the event or people will email us and say, hey, I'm sorry, I know it's last minute, the event is full, can I come? And usually we're able to say yes to that. We averaged um, one event per week for the whole year in 2023. This year, we are, are on track to do even more events than that. All of our events are free and open to anyone who wants to register for them. Okay, thanks. How about John and Pat? Do you have any tips and tricks for meetings, walks, forays? Um, we've been, <clears throat> we've definitely not done uh, weekly events or multiple events per week that's that's really awesome that you guys do that <laughs> that's impressive um 
since we started in 2018, you know, our big commitment was just to do one event a month. And um, up until very recently, they were all free. And um, and a lot of our events were, you know, either free or, or pretty affordable. Um, as, you know, we've become more organized and we've had more members even before we became organized, it's required a bit more than just me to uh, put into that. However, it's still up until this last year, all of the events, any finances that went into it, any planning, you know, coordination, it was all just on me for, for you know, until last year, 2018. Um, so we've established, you know, some, some volunteer coordinator people, and uh, we've, we've also been involved with Kind of getting some of the other clubs in the region involved with our event planning. Uh, yeah, John, feel free to to chime so, in if. So your I'm club has anything. to reflect the um the area where you are. We're pretty rural. Um, the first if um I'm trying to figure out how I can map all our members. I have all their addresses, and I want to do like one of those maps where you have like a bubble map of where everyone is. But we mm. have two town centers, Charlesville and Lynchburg, and the furthest someone could drive if they went from one person's house to another might be four hours. So in-person stuff tends to be the foray once a month because people will drive to that. And it's midway, fortunately, between most of our members. Um, and then workshops, same sort of thing. We try to put them in the middle of that population hub. We probably need to move more into doing more Zoom things to get, because you know, people are busy, you know, and I got a lot of stuff going on. The forays are tremendously uh, successful. And a lot of our group just wants to be out in the woods. You know, if you did a poll, I'd say 80% of our people want to go out and have fun in the woods and then do identification, some yeah. not all of them. And so we emphasize that. We definitely want to open up more, I think, to education, but we have to get more people involved to do it. We don't have enough people to deliver the content right now, being a fairly modest sized club in a fairly rural area. So, you know, I'm sort of jealous of the idea of being in Philadelphia, like because of the number of people and all the partners you have there. And we're just gradually working that our way through that. Oh, every, um, one every one other thing. Sure. <laughs> one one other thing. Uh, I forgot to mention. You know, and and we had talked about this before the meeting. As far as like content, right? Like, you know, we have a few people in our club who are mushroom growers. A few people who can speak on different things. But eventually, as a new club, you're going to have to reach beyond to either invite somebody to come speak, invite somebody to do a Zoom, and we've had a couple really, you know great people who have been involved whether it's you know our basket weaving uh karen milnes did basket weaving with us the arlene and alan Bissett did came up and did a elite you know workshop with us in identification uh brit bunyard came but there was there's one piece of advice that i got from uh the president of the west virginia club um, k and they got just this really cool speaker to come down from like Connecticut. I'm like, how the heck did you get him to come all the way down from Connecticut? And she just said, doesn't hurt to ask. And she literally was just going around emailing people, texting people that she knew through her connections. You know, you'll get turned down a bunch of times, but like, you know, I, I knew Karen Milnes made great baskets. Hey, you want to come make baskets with our club? Sure. Hey, Britt, like, when are you going to hit up my club, man? Come on. Like, I've been waiting for years. Oh, yeah, I'm actually coming down that region. Like, oh, yeah, let's make it work. And just the besets, like, I've been pestering them for years. Like, come hang out with me in the woods. Come see my club. And, of course, they came up. Like, they're they're lovely people and, and made an appearance. And, you know, it never hurts to ask. You'll get rejected sometimes. But, you know, the mushroom community is small, you know, relatively speaking. And um, people enjoy helping out. So, yeah, biggest piece of advice, just ask. Great. I get on board with that, man. It's great advice. Yeah. So our, our next question here is how do our clubs navigating different regulations? Let's start with permits. Is anybody here gathering permits to collect in their specific regions? I know this is more important in specific parts of the country than others. I'll say that um, officially the National Forest um, in Colorado requires a free personal permit to collect two five-gallon buckets for personal use. 
Um, that's what's on the books. I don't know a single person who has ever gotten this permit. And okay. so the, what our club does is we protect ourselves and our community with waivers. Let's just assume, have the members assume their own risk. Okay. How about other clubs? Before we get into waivers, is anybody else getting permits for their collecting areas? Yeah. Um, um, yeah, go ahead. I... um recently applied for collection permits in five of our local state parks. Um, I am still waiting to hear back from the person who I was communicating with about these permits. It has been about two months since I submitted these permits, but I was specifically asked by the head ranger at two of these state parks to fill out this permit application. For the first couple of years, we assumed that we were protected under the law that states collection is permitted in the state parks for personal use. Leaving it up to interpretation what personal use exactly meant. Uh, but after we had this foray where over 100 people showed up, um, it became really clear that 100 people is not personal use. Even I can recognize that. Um and so I have applied for these permits and I am waiting to hear back from my friends at the DCNR with a hopeful yes. And if it is not a yes, we are going to have to do a really big pivot in our programming for the year. Um, but along the way, since we moved out of Philadelphia, um, we have made a lot of friends at the local environmental centers and we are hopeful that if we are pushed back into the city of Philadelphia, that we will be able to get some special one day collection permits in some of our more local parks, which we're hopeful to do anyway. Uh, so that's what I have to say about permits. Okay, thank you. I think there was another comment about permits. Um, I was I was gonna say we had an event at, a, I, I don't remember what it's, you know, designation is. It was a campground area. Do you remember, is that a, wilderness recreation area john where cave mountain lake was it's a federal recreation um, area but it's not wilderness yeah yeah so so it was interesting you know we were trying to to create this event called the joint foray and we had have had this vision even before we organized more recently i've had this vision since the very very beginning to partner with some of the other regional clubs and come and do these regional forays we were calling joint forays um, the challenge is obviously where to walk in the woods and collect your mushrooms because state parks, as Sam is finding out, you know, they, I've heard they take like at least six months to get back to you. Like you're not going to get your permit filled out. So you better plan ahead. Um, National Forest is pretty open, but once you go beyond, I don't remember what it is in Virginia, National Forest is like 20 or 30 person group. Somebody will correct me, I'm sure, but um anyway our our event was right next to what i saw as great national forest and so we were going to have these small little groups go out well that part of the, the national forest also happened to be a, a a wilderness area which has a whole other set of you know guidelines and regulations so what we did is we reached out to one of the park rangers who kind of helped facilitate and you know, manage that area. And it took a while for him to respond to us. I mean, I'm sure he has a lot on his plate, but, you know, sometimes it's a permit. Sometimes it's just getting a guy to write you an email with the correct credentials saying, sure, take your people and pick on this trail, this trail, this trail. And yeah, it was, it was very stressful leading up to the event. We had not applied for the permits. We were waiting for this guy to send us an email what he had verbalized you know on the phone and we're like uh please 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 send us this email finally he sent it we had the correct credentials and we were able to do what we needed so you know sometimes reach out to those people in conjunction with filling out your permits you might get one response quicker. 
the other. And we have a plan for this year is to make, make friends with rangers and supervisors. It actually mm -hmm. is really worthwhile to cultivate long-term relationships. Another of idea, ideas is to use the NAMA rare fungi survey and say, it helps that, that they know that you're not coming in to just grab every mushroom you can for edible purposes. And we can say, hey, we're looking for rare mushrooms. And here's our sheet. This is what we're looking for in your park. And we'll tell you if we find it there. So we're kind of looking for angles uh, that would you know, make it reasonable for you to be there. They need a story. And then and we hope, we're hoping to get a couple of rangers in our club. <laughs> That's our goal for the next year. We have one. Yeah. That's a great goal. Can I, can I mention one more thing about the permits? Please. In Colorado, in National Forest, you're allowed to have up to 12 people in a group without a permit. And then otherwise, you need um, an outfitter's permit to lead people into the forest for any kind of educational anything, like whether you're taking them up a mountain or taking them on a walk. Like you have to have an outfitter's permit and those are all grandfathered into all the outfitters in Colorado. So it's basically, you can't have access to it. So part of um, our club's mission is to lobby to for them to create a permit for forays and foraging in general, which I think is really doable. It's probably a bunch of administrative work and and being annoying to government officials but i think it's it's doable um and the f mushroom festivals in colorado get a special use permit to take groups out and then those come with a strict list of regulations like you can't pick a mushroom within you know a quarter mile of a stream or something crazy like that um, but you're allowed to make observations and, and do all the things that you can do on a foray. Um, and one of the things that we stress in our club is that our forays are not about, um, foraging, right. Mm -hmm. You know, they're about fungal ecology specifically. And so it's not about going to see what mushrooms we can eat. It's about going to see what mushrooms we can see. <laughs> so it sounds like the moral of the story with permitting is every area of North America is different. So you really need to learn your local regulations and you really need to foster relationships with the, with the landowners and the land managers, wherever you're at. Um, so the next topic on here is one that a lot of people ask about is liabilities and, and liability waivers and insurance. Insurance probably being one of the biggest obstacles that I think that clubs run into. Um, Sam, could you start us talking about insurance? I knew the Philadelphia Club has recently gone down this road. Yeah. Um, so last year, I had the pleasure of leading a guided walk for an organization called Pinelands Adventures, which is actually in New Jersey. And um, after our walk was over, um, I had some time with their... Um, head of education, her name is Allison, to sort of just pick her brain about that sort of thing. So she recommended that um, I use the same broker that they use. And that broker is CBiz. C-B-I-Z is the name of the broker. And this is a nationwide insurance broker. Um, so they were able to uh, speak with me on multiple occasions to make sure that our board of directors would be covered, um, that we would have liability insurance, directors and officers insurance, um, as well as um, insurance for club properties. After kind of talking about some of the things that we did, that was one of the things that they recommended. Um, this company was really wonderful. Like I said, they met with me multiple times to go over a lot of my different concerns about the coverage, um, knowing that it was a pretty hefty price tag for our club at the time. Um, but just uh, for reference, in the city of Philadelphia, we have up to a million dollars in liability coverage for our event guests. And we pay um, $1,500 a year for this insurance. Um, for me, that price tag is definitely worth the peace of mind that it offers me as a club leader. And um, I am really glad that it was really easy to get insurance once I found this company. 
All right, thank you, Sam. How about other clubs? Anybody else here carrying insurance? Um, we, <clears throat> Blue Ridge is, our, our BRMS is not currently insured. Um, but I, a couple comments on that. When we were looking for venues to hold our joint foray, our first ever joint foray last year, you know, we had like four or five different options. We went out to visit them, had some really good talks with people. And almost every single one of them was like, yeah, if you're not insured, you can't, you can't come here and hold your event, which is crazy. Cause you know, like they are insured and they want us to be in, you know, it's, it's, it's a, it's a little bit of a headache. Um, we did look at like one time, you know, single, single event insurance. And it was like almost six or $700 for a weekend to, you know, and, and as I was comparing other premiums of what other clubs might be paying, it's like, we really just need to get insurance. So we did find a really cool place that was like, Oh yeah, you're fine. Come on in. <laughs> so we, we got in at the cave mountain Lake, uh, campground and did our event there um but you know in terms of like how to find insurance i'm definitely going to be looking at that broker that you talked about sam i also do have two other leads one of which i found yesterday just giving a general mycology talk to some master gardeners yesterday no sunday right before a club meeting john um, a woman came up and, you know, I had mentioned something about insurance in my talk, ironically enough. And a woman came up and she's like, hey, I want to, you know, give you my phone number because I I manage the insurance policy for our master, master naturalist, club, you know, chapter. And if you had any questions, I can tell you who locally does that here and what we pay. And so, yeah, just. I found like tapping into other groups who are kind of similar and finding out what they do. Again, it's all about like networking community and, and just asking questions. Um, so yeah, thank you for that other uh, lead, Sam, because I'm going to be putting that kind of in my brain as well. So. Uh-oh, oh, there you go. Yeah, how about my dog was barking, sorry. <laughs> how about liability waivers? Um, I know Hamilton mentioned this earlier in a uh, in the Q and A. Can we talk about liability waivers? How many people are using them? Go to Hamilton. <laughs> I mean, I think they're like the 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 shortcut around most legal issues. I think I think you can, in plain language or in legalese, cover your ass in every way you need by putting liability on members and not on the club itself and i think you know in terms of like not having a budget to buy annual insurance or event insurance or any of these things like i think event event insurance you can't do a liability waiver um but you know in, in, if you're a small club with a small annual budget like you can lean heavily on those liability waivers and just make sure everybody understands the risks. And and mostly what's risky is taking people out into the forest. <laughs> it's not about eating mushrooms. It's about falling down. So we, um, the waivers are um, not as powerful as they appear. Um, it's worth doing. We uh, get away without using them for the most part because we're in a place that has an agricultural ex exception in Virginia. And there's a big sign that says, if you're injured or killed here, the state of Virginia says you can't sue the people who are taking you there. So we're really lucky. But that's just one of our sites. And it's a just, it's peculiar, I think, to Virginia, probably. There may be some other states. The uh, I think the way we're going to be doing the way we talked about it, probably for other events, because why not? Although most attorneys will tell you they're only a thin sort of veneer between you and a problem. Uh, one thing I forgot to mention about the 501c3 is it does in itself provide you some protection because the corporation is a person and the person that person is the first one to be sued is your corporation, not the, the board of directors. We don't have board of directors insurance either, but um, so we probably will be doing the waivers. Although I, I talked to a bunch of attorneys who say they're not, you know, it's not as great as it sounds, but why not? <laughs> Same. Yeah. And, and also something, you know, worth mentioning too, is like, 
Yeah, that that was one of the big pushes before I met John to get 501c3 is I was leading all these people into the woods and we were always meeting at the same location, which is this beautiful, beautiful place called the, you know, the Cory Gardens at Skylar. Anybody going through Virginia, go tour their facility. It's beautiful. Um, but we had access to like 500 acres and you know, this beautiful like native plant garden and an indoor facility with a projector. And the Bernice and Armin, the, the owners of this, you know, project and program kind of let us meet there for free because they really were excited about mushrooms and what we were doing. And we would identify mushrooms on their property. As beautiful as that place is, we really wanted to explore other parts of Virginia. And I was just too scared to do that. Like, Pat Mitchell taking a group of people out into the woods at Skyler is fine at the Cory Gardens, but as soon as I go outside of that, you know, agro-tourism bill protected place, people could fall and get hurt and could possibly try and sue me. It's very unlikely, you know, I don't present as somebody with a lot of money, but it is likely, like I'm the person in charge. So yeah, I really wanted to branch out and and I felt like getting a 501c3 in order was the first step to that. Great, hey, thank you. So we do have some questions here. I've been answering some of them in the Q&A, um, but I'm gonna kind of go through some of these questions and see if we can um, get some answers for them. So one of the questions is how many hours each week or month is each board member expanding expending in their position. So just a, very briefly, anybody have any idea how much work are each of you putting into your clubs and maybe some of your other members? It's uh, kind of sporadic for me. Sometimes, sometimes it'll be a lot like, you know, 10 plus 20 plus hours a week, just fixing internet stuff, posting stuff, writing stuff. And then I'll slack off because it's more all season or mushroom season and you won't see Pat for a couple of weeks and then everything piles back up. I mean, this is not a very healthy way to do it. You know, not high functioning like uh, Hamilton is, but <laughs> you know, I'd say on average, like five or 10 hours a week, you know, mm -hmm. not bad. I would say five or 10 hours a month, depending on the month. And then the board, you know, we only meet once every, I think our, our bylaws say we have to meet three times a year, you know, and, it, and it's, yeah, it's been, it's, we've been basically on that track. So, you know, the board members might put in three hours every three months. Dina, how about Rhode Island? Your club's pretty active. You have a lot of stuff going on. I see how much work. How how are you spreading that work out amongst people? Um, that's a great question. Um, we do try to meet uh, once a month for the board. So that um, but a, a lot of it is is on me, and um, it's it's a lot of work and it's a lot of fun. Um, but. Yeah, it, it is a big time investment and it, it involves a lot of thinking about stuff before you can even go ahead and do it. So um, planning the behind the behind the scenes stuff is what takes the most time. The events are fun and quick and over before you know it, but it's all that pre-planning. Um, I did think of something I wanted to mention about permits. Um, making a relationship with the herbarium was really helpful for me because they were able to secure the state, um, those state properties, uh, permission slips for me. So maybe you can right. reach out to your local herbarium, Sam, and get help. Yeah. Another relationship. Yeah. An herbarium relationship is definitely in the works right now for the Philadelphia Mycology Club and is on my permit application. So mm -hmm. hopefully, Fingers crossed they approve my permit. Um, but on the subject of volunteer time weekly, I would say that I personally spend 15 to 20 hours a week uh, volunteering to lead my club, uh, which includes a lot of leading events. Um, but I actually have a spreadsheet for how many hours each of my volunteers spends also. 
on average. Um, and it is 68 hours a week spread over um, 15 or so volunteers, wow. including myself. Okay. So those are some pretty hard numbers there. How about, um, you know, the Philadelphia Club does the, uh, the, the Wednesday night work groups. Do you want to mention that? I think that's a good way of getting people engaged. I would love to. Um, so as I mentioned, I have a team of between 15 and 20 volunteers. Um, and we meet weekly on Wednesdays at um, our vice president's house. Um, and we cook a meal together. And we do things like answer emails, plan events, um, do our treasury spreadsheets, apply for permits, make YouTube videos, um, and really just foster a community in our volunteer group. And that has been so incredibly helpful and has really propelled our club forward as an organization to have this tight group of volunteers meeting weekly and being a community together. Great, thank you, Sam. All right. Um, another question here. Somebody mentioned that it was really cool to hear Dina mentioning bringing translators into an event. So they're wondering how panelists approach making events and meetings more accessible to diverse groups. So anywhere from translators for AL, ASL and other languages, making walks outside accessible to different people, mm -hmm. et cetera. Anybody have any comments on that? I, I was able to, um, the, the translators were supplied by the community garden um, folks, the urban growers. Um, so, you know, going to the communities that you're trying to reach, um, that's how you would find the, the translators. Hmm. Okay, that's a good point. Um, I I wanted to throw something out there is, you know, one one thing when I started the club, I really wanted to be a central point between these two kind of bigger cities, Lynchburg and Charlottesville. And so, you know, we got lucky with the property, as we mentioned earlier, you know, being able to meet there for free and have access to some beautiful woods. But in <clears throat> in my attempt to become more accessible, I actually put us an hour, like 50 minutes away from both cities. And so a lot of the people, you know, that, you know, we could be able to reach if we we're meeting within those cities that don't drive or don't have access to, you know, funds to get public transportation that far, you know, that we just made it a lot harder for them to get to it. So as a club, we've been intentionally trying to do events, you know, in in the cities of Lynchburg and Charlottesville and, and see what kind of response we get and what kind of people come. We just did a uh, cultivation workshop in a storefront in Lynchburg. We've done a couple uh, events at this nature center in Charlottesville. And, and that's kind of one of our goals in the coming years to sort of keep meeting in the central spot for everybody to come together, but also have kind of these satellite smaller events to sort of see what kind of community exists and wants to tap into us in those actual cities. Great. Thanks, Pat. How about in Philadelphia, Sam? Philadelphia has a really diverse population. And I know that's a big, a big thing with the Philadelphia Club trying to tap into some of those, some of the diverse populations that live in Philadelphia. Any thoughts on that? Yeah. So um, we have offered a few um, wheelchair accessible guided walks within the city limits to try and accommodate for people who need mobility devices or um, need an even surface to walk on. In addition to um, physical accessibility, I have um, obtained a personal amplifier. So it's like a little microphone and a tiny little speaker that I wear around my neck to make sure that I can be heard by an entire group of people if I'm leading a guided walk um, so that people don't get lost, um, so that people don't feel the need to be super close to me, and so that people who 
um, are maybe hard of hearing or um, partially deaf can also still hear me. Um, although it would be awesome to get a translator, that would be so cool. Um, in addition to that type of accessibility, having our club be 100% donation funded and totally free, um, that is another type of accessibility. Um, we are looking this year to offer guided walks in more diverse neighborhoods. Um, so we are looking at offering guided walks in some urban and underserved communities. We also offer stewardship days in some of our underserved communities, specifically the Cobbs Creek neighborhood. And um, we are we have like a long term partnership with a black teaching artist who does a lot of um mushroom themed craft events with us. And so we are able to uh, pay her for her time. And then um, she has a really diverse network of people also. Um, there is this idea within the diversity, equity, inclusion and accessibility movement that um, many people of color will not um, show up to event if there are not other people of color there. And so um, having a diverse community kind of starts with um, maybe like a peace offering, going back to the idea of like, it doesn't hurt to ask, and then um, building out a community from there. So um, those are the ways in which Philadelphia is able to be accessible at this time. It would be really cool to get a translator though, and I'm going to put that on my long-term planning list. <laughs> Great. Okay. I One more question here that is actually a couple different questions that I've seen that's kind of addressing the same idea. And that's about technology, technology, using technology to communicate with people. Um, sometimes you get some people that are resistant to, to anything beyond email. Um, other things like trying to get people to use INAT and stuff like that. Um, do you have any insights on that? Like how are we communicating to everyone to make sure we really get the uh, message out there to people that everyone is welcome? It's really hard. It is hard, right? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I look at it, I, I feel like there's, you know, I don't think very many people at all are ever expecting to get an actual printed newsletter in the mail anymore. But, you know, email lists are like probably the most accessible thing for most people right now, right? Beyond yeah. social. Go email, ahead. Email is really critical for our club. But every time I put up a poster for one of our meetings, we get a better turnout. Hmm. Poster. Like so, a physical poster? A physical poster, yeah. I mean, I just hit up my town, which is a small town. And then for larger events, we go to the towns on either side of us. And I think there's plenty of people out there that just look at bulletin boards. And, you know, if you just catch someone's eye, it's worth putting up a hmm. poster. I love that idea. And actually, we have been discussing um, putting up some print media in some of our more urban parks for events that are happening in those parks so that we can um, better access those communities who might not already be in our network for various reasons. Um, I do think that there is still uh, an application for print media. And I think it's cool that you're putting up posters in your town. Oh yeah, it's great. It works. <laughs> and it's yeah, fun when, to make when <laughs> when we first started, I I did that for like I think first year and I just got tired of of running around and stapling things myself. But if I had other people helping out, which you have a lot more people helping out, I mean I got a lot of really interesting people as a result of that. Um yeah. But thank you for the reminder. Awesome. Well, we are getting close to the end of our webinar. Uh, a couple of things that, uh, as we were coming up with the agenda, one of some a couple of things that were pointed out by the club relations committee is to go slow and make steady progress. Right. So nobody is getting organized overnight, and you know some of these things they take a they take a long time to get done. So like steady progress is really the key here. And another thing that the committee pointed out is to record your history. 
this is a thing that a lot of a lot of clubs they look back you know 10 years 20 years passes also and they're like this big booming club and they often regret not recording some of their histories from the very beginning some of the key people that really put in some serious legwork to get the clubs going um so i'd like to at this point thank all of our panelists that came out tonight it's been a very a great i learned a lot tonight listening to everybody i could hear our panelists learning stuff from each other and i hope all of our uh, participants that came tonight certainly got something out of this so thank you very much for that this has been recorded so this will go on the nama website so um it will probably take a few days to get there but once it is there we will have that up there um there is one final question here um somebody's asking about how they could follow up with um some of the panelists here so if any of the panelists are interested in getting questions from other people, you can tell me that, um, I guess, off, off the camera here, um, if you're interested in being contacted by other people. I think other people have questions, more questions that they would like answered. Um, and if you would like to be contacted, um, I'll leave the um, this up for one more, for one more minute. Um, maybe the person that asked that can uh, talk to me in the chat and I can get their email and we can kind of connect afterwards so this has been really insightful and helpful for me to hear the other club leaders talk about their experiences and what they're doing and i just really appreciate everyone and all the hard work you're doing for mycology so and our community so thank you so much all right well, thank you everyone for coming tonight and have a great night thank Bye. you thanks Bye. for doing this thank you. <laughs>